today I'm going to be looking at two older NAS models. One from Linksys and one from Thekus. Just take a look at and see how much NAS boxes have improved over the last 10 to 15 years. And to see if these boxes are still usable as an old backup box on a modern system today. I'm going to be comparing these older guys against kind of what newer models would offer in kind of a similar price range and feature set you can get today. So I've gotten this Linksys NAS working right now. Um, it needed a little bit of resetting, so you have to use the little kind of inset reset button to get the password and network set back to DHCP. And then it was just kind of a little playing around to get them to work, but it now shows up on the network and I can access its web administration page. So this is the default page I get when I access this system. I get an administration login and an access my files page. I can kind of tell this is an older website because I have a 1080p screen now and it doesn't use much space. So let's make that a little bit bigger. If I click on access my files, it asks for a username and password. And opening it in lets me see files that I have. So I currently have a file folder called RAID0 that I put files. Um, no files are in it right now. And personal info just lets me set info about my user, I guess, and change my password. And then the administration tab gives me another HTTP basic login prompt. And then once logged in, I get to see a few more status things in a bit more detail. So for my test drives, I use these WD-10 EVVES drives. Reasonably fast. Um, compared to modern NAS systems, I'd say there's actually relatively few options in here. Like, I have my status, users, folders, system options, um, which I can use for like email and network settings. But beyond that, I don't have any advanced features in here like I'd kind of expect in a more modern NAS solution. Um, I can hear right now I've spun the fans up as it probably went into the try to access the data or it hit a thermal threshold and that fan's definitely not quiet. I would not want to be in the same room as this for a long period of time. That could potentially be due to the fan wearing out but I'm guessing it wasn't silent new. No. Gives me scan disk utilities, but not too much beyond that. This is a pretty bare one, and it doesn't give you any insights into how this system works internally also. And for disk configuration, I get two separate disks, which it recommends, which is odd. I personally go RAID 1 as a general recommendation. Two disks configured as JVOD or LVM. Um, I guess the big advantage here over RAID 0 is you can mix and match drive sizes. RAID 0 is the best speed and mirroring. Now let's talk a little bit about speed and accessing files. So the first thing about this is due to the age of this unit, this uses SMB1 only. So in Windows, you have to type in Windows um, features and you get this turn Windows features on and off prompt. And then in here, you can scroll down to where it says SMB 1.0 slash CIFS file sharing support. And the thing is, um, Microsoft has turned this off due to many large exploits that let you do remote code execution. It's huge security flaws, so the kind of solution is just turn it off. Not great, though. You can go turn it back on, and it works. And if you turn it off, it doesn't even give you an error message that tells you much. It just says it can't find that network path. So that's a bit annoying. But I turned it back on, and now I'm going to open File Explorer, and if I go to its IP in File Sharing, I can... Wait a second, and it'll show me all my drives, and I can, as one of these, map these. I haven't played with permissions right now. I think it's just fine to give it as everyone has admin access, and now I can mount it. And if I want, I can take a file like one of my pictures here I made a screenshot of earlier, and just copy it. And it copies the files across. And if I want to copy potentially a larger file, so I have an image file on a temp folder on my C drive, um, this is just a continuous large file, which is kind of the testing peak speeds often. And, oh, that's not great. That's three and a half megabytes per second. And my gut is that is way too slow. So I, that's why I'm running RAID 0 right now. Because I tried testing in RAID 1, saw these speeds, and like, maybe it needs more disk performance. So I put it in RAID 0, basically no difference. Um, I then started doing a bit Googling. It's also not any common limit, so it's not something like the limit of a um, 100 meg network card. So I started doing a little bit of um, Googling, and I found this small net review from quite a few years ago. 
And yeah. Ooh. Ooh, that's not great. Um, that's kind of in the spirit of kind of, that's a decimal. Like this unit, depending on the exact file size, was getting 6 megabytes per second. Um, was getting, and this unit in this review, depending on the exact file size and test, was getting about 4, 3.5, 3 megabytes per second. Which is not great. Now the other weird thing looking back was the other like Synology NASs were getting better but not that much better. Also Googling I learned a little bit more about the placement of this product in the product stack. And this apparently was a very cheap unit new. Saying about two, 100 pounds new or probably a little bit over $100 without drives I'm assuming. Um, which you almost can't get a NAS these days for. Um, even with inflation, finding a two-bay NAS for much under like 150 or 200 is quite hard. Um, but this feels pretty gimped in terms of performance. And for modern use, yeah, it works fine in Windows 10, but I'd almost say this makes it too slow for almost any practical use these days. And one more quick little test to do is just by copying two files at once instead of one. And the speeds have dropped down. So it probably is like a CPU limit. And this likely has a single core CPU and it's pushing the limits of that CPU. It has the ability to use these USB sticks. Um, and it works as just any other drive in the NAS. And it seems to also have a button to copy data. But really doesn't help too much from the looks of it. Another weird thing I just noticed. When I'm playing around in the UI and copying files, it's weird, the UI gets even slower. So if I hit refresh right now, it's taking much longer than it normally would, and the file copying gets super slow. Which really is making me think the CPU in this is just way too slow for what it needs to be. Now that I've had a chance to look at this lower end Linksys NAS 200, let's take a look at a higher end NAS from about the same era. This unit came out in roughly 2008 and has a Ficus N5200. Compared to the um, NAS 200, this one has a lot more features, a lot more little goodies at the time. And I'm going to take a look at that now to see how well those have kind of aged and see if that makes this system a better system to use today or if it made it age better in many ways. Comparing these two systems, the first thing that's easily noticeable is that the N5200 is a significantly bigger system. Its footprint and volume, I'd say, is roughly twice as big. And also on the front, you can see it has five hot swap drive bays compared to this unit that only has two of which on the back. It also has a bit more I.O. on the back, featuring an eSATA port, which is likely for drive expansion in the future, a serial port, a second Ethernet jack, and what looks like cutouts for other potential ones, maybe in different models that I don't have. The front also features a little LCD display, which is kind of useful because it shows you info like the IP address and its status while just glancing at the unit. This is compared to the NAS 200, which has a relatively poor front LEDs, I'd say. The hardware on the inside is also a good amount more powerful. While still not very fast for its day, it did feature a Pentium 3 class CPU. It was originally designed for laptops and half a gigabyte of RAM. This should give this system significantly more performance for doing things like RAID configurations and higher speed transfers. And also to facilitate those higher speed transfers, both of the network jacks on this NAS are gigabit compared to the 100 meg ports on the NAS 200. Now that I've had a chance to look at the hardware, let's take a look at the software. And both of these devices do suffer from the same software issues where it is an older website. I've zoomed in here to make it easier to view, but this website is designed for lower res older displays and has a lot of just kind of legacy web design, I'd say. But the nice thing is it does give you a good amount more info compared to the other one. So if I'm looking under system, it does show me things like CPU usage, which is nice to see. Um, a few span speeds where the other one didn't provide it. And also looking at services status, I can see it does have a bit more. So it starts to get into things like media servers, um, has a few media server things, and it also gives me um, iSCSI in here, and it gives me things like NFS. So these are a bit more advanced of a file transfer protocol compared to just using SMB or CIFS. And also looking through the menus, I can see kind of a bit more of the advanced features. So advanced support for UPS um, automatic shutoff, wake on LAN, automatic turn on and off at specific times, 
Um, looking through the storage configuration, I also get more options. I've already set up a RAID here on this drive. Um, it supports all the traditional RAID levels of 0, 1, 5, 10, and 6. I've just set up a RAID 0 on all the drives so I can test the best performance of this system. Um, it appears to be using Linux MD RAID under the hood. Almost all of these NAS units use Linux MD. It's relatively solid for what it is. But it does give me options for things like ISO mounts if I wanted to do that. One downside of using plain Linux MD RAID is that it doesn't let you mix drive sizes. And many users like a NAS to be able to mix a drive size because it makes it easy if you have a stack of existing hard drives to slap them in here and get the max space that you would expect or theoretically could get instead of having to buy all identical drives. And companies like Synology have kind of brute forced that into MD by putting multiple arrays and having it put it together, which is a little value add for some users. This unfortunately doesn't have it, and it is a newer feature, I'd say. Looking up networks, it labels its network ports WAN and LAN, which is interesting. Um, looking through it, it doesn't seems to support um, the link aggregation for load balancing failover and 802.3 um, AD. Um, it's weird it calls it LAN and LAN because it doesn't appear to be... Well, I guess it does have a DHCP server, so you could technically use it as a router, it looks like, but that'd be a weird use. Um, I'd probably just use it for teaming if you had to use both. Um, network services, you get a lot more AFP, NFS, and one of this, since this is a higher end model, one of its bigger features was iSCSI support. So if you have a basic kind of virtualization, or want to do kind of the fake hard drive for programs that don't support network storage over SMB, um, you get similar account supports and system gives you things like modules, so it looks like this did have support for adding modules to it, so you potentially could add more features in the future if you wanted to via modules, firmware upgrades, and reboots and shutdowns. So now that I've set this up, let's go take a look at it um, on the network and see kind of what sorts of speeds I can get on here. I've just set up a RAID 0 on all my drives, and we're going to just call it the testy folder was what I was using. Um, my most basic test is just copying a single large file in Explorer, which is relatively characteristic of what a user could expect just copying a file um, from a computer. So I'm going to do that now with a just install file. And looking at it right now, it looks like it peaked as it was copying into RAM, and then it kind of settled down at about 47 megabytes per second. This is all being done over a gigabit switch, so my network should be able to easily hit kind of 100 mega bytes per second and I'm seeing it steadily sit at those speeds. Um, I've done some other testing on this NAS hardware and this appears to be the limit of how much data you can move on this system probably due to CPU limitations potentially bus limits though. But this isn't while these speeds aren't what you theoretically could get on a connection like this they are still much better than what the other NAS gets, and what I consider to be fully usable for a lot of uses these days. Um, you can play basically any movie off of a speed this size, um, backups, even relatively large ones of like a multi-terabyte system would complete fairly quickly for incremental backups, and I can see it being a fairly usable system today. And here is the crystal disk mark on the screen. Compared to the other NAS I was looking at here, this one is much faster, and what I consider to be basically fully usable for day-to-day -day tasks today on a NAS. Now that I've had the chance to look at two older NAS units, let's take a look at what some of the advantages and disadvantages are of using one of these compared to a newer solution like a QNAP or Synology or a DIY solution like an older PC or new PC running Unraid or TrueNAS or another OS. So the big advantages are form factor and price. If you want to do a DIY PC, you generally can't get a 5-bay system into something this small, especially for the price you can get these for. Prices vary a lot, which is why I haven't talked about it very much. I got this one on Craigslist for about 60 bucks a few years ago, and I got my other one from an e-waste pile for free. And that's kind of, if you can hunt around and know where to find these, you can get them nearly free often. Another advantage compared to a typical desktop PC is power consumption. Since these are built with low-end parts and low-power PSUs, 
They generally use a lot less power, especially at lower loads than a desktop PC would, especially if you're reusing an older one that typically uses more power. These NAS boxes are normally 50 watts or less, depends on the drives, whereas a desktop PC might idle at 50 watts, depending on the age. Compared to a DIY PC or used PC, they're plug and play, so you pretty much just find them on the network, go into the UI, you don't have to install an OS, you don't have to play around with install drives or a lot of that's a lot less hassle, it's a lot less menu clicks, and it's a lot less time. Now that I've got the advantages of these, I made a list of disadvantages that I'd say are fairly common on these units. It definitely varies with the used NAS model, but these are fairly common in these models I've looked at and a lot of other ones. So going through the list, drive size limits. Two tibby bytes is quite common, but other limits are found and you just can't use drives bigger than that. A lot of the times they will let you use up to the drive size limit and the extra capacity will never be used. Sometimes they just won't work. Next thing, SMB1. As I explained before, it's kind of a pain to get Windows 10 to work. It's another step. You get a weird error message and it's a security issue in a lot of programs and they're probably never going to patch it because they just don't want you to use it at all. Um, slow. Yeah, first one I looked at, those speeds were abysmal. The second one here I'd say is fine, but I, with the file size is getting bigger, there's kind of a point where it's like, it's too slow, you're spending all your time copying, and it's going to limit what you can do. I mean, you're getting to the point on some of those with that low-end NAS where you can't play a lot of 4K movie files, which really isn't that much bandwidth. Um, less RAID options. So a lot of newer solutions like Synology and Unraid have kind of these mixed RAID options where you can kind of slap together a pile of drives and get max capacity and parity from it. These almost older ones almost never did that and you just got the traditional RAID levels like 0, 1, 5, and 10. And that could be annoying um, and that limits your ability to reuse drives which can kind of hurt the value proposition because now you either need to do JBOD which doesn't give you redundancy or you have to do something like buying all the same size drives. Next thing I said was no apps. So most new NASs keep building on the idea of we're NAS but we have enough extra power to do other things. So you can run a um, Plex server on it, you can run a little torrent seed box, you can run like Nextcloud or a little website. There's kind of a little handful of apps. And these ones, some of these have options but they're not supported and they're really out of date. Whereas the new ones, they have quite a few cool little things you can do on them now that you really couldn't do on most of these older boxes. Next thing, not supported. These are almost never supported by hardware or software. So there's never going to be any security updates for them. There's never going to be probably new hardware coming on the market if you want replacements. So it's all used parts if you need to replace anything. Things like hard drive trays, yeah, kind of a pain to find. Stuff like that. And that brings to the next one, which is hardware failure. As boards age, they generally get more likely to die. And with some of these boxes being over 10 years old, they're eventually going to call it. So it's probably going to be sooner in one of these boxes than a year or two old Synology or a new Synology or desktop PC. But if you can get over all of these, and I'd say kind of some of my better applications for this would be like a backup box. So, you know, toss this in a corner and just have something like Veeam or rsync just slowly dump files to it. And if you're doing that, a lot of these don't really matter if you're just using it as a basic backup box or a secondary backup box. So if you have a new one and then you use like an older one of these just in case the new one had issues. And a lot of the issues also with things like um, security issues and stuff can arguably be helped by if you don't leave it on most of the time. So you turn it on once every month or two, copy all the new files you have, and then turn it off. And if you can get these cheap, it's a lot better just to have another one of these boxes as a just-in-case thing, in case something happens, you have one more copy of your data. Well, thanks for watching this video going over kind of some of the pluses and minuses of these used NASs and my experience with using two of them. Let me know if you have any questions or if there's any more boxes you want me to look at more in detail. And thanks for watching.